started. First off, uh, good evening to everybody. Let's turn to our Bibles to the book of Matthew, chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, the Lord laid a lot on my heart, so it might be a long long one tonight, so just sit tight. Please listen closely. Um, I might be doing some long preaching, as I said. Don't be sitting near no windows tonight, or else you're bound to fall out the window. Hopefully, hopefully not, though. But um, let's read uh, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And let's read verses 12 to 14. Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21, verse number, um, verse number 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Now look at verse number 23. Uh, this is the following day after he just flipped the tables and things like that. Look at verse number 23. And when he was come into the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came uh, unto him as he was teaching and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? So I want to preach on tonight a controversial subject. Uh, one that will draw attention from both sides of the spectrum. Those that who we would call ultra-conservatives in those who would identify as being liberal. Uh, the title of tonight's message is Balancing Convictions, Compassions, and Compromise. Okay, Balancing Convictions, Compassions, and Compromise. So turn to Proverbs chapter 11. be another good one to go to. Proverbs chapter 11, proverb of the day today actually. So it happened to work out like that. Proverbs chapter 11. Let's see, look at verse number 1. Proverbs chapter 11, it's page 876 if you have a Bible in the pew. Proverbs chapter 11, look at verse number 1. It says, A false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is His delight. Now, for those of you taking notes, write down Leviticus 19.35, Leviticus 19.36, in Amos, in Amos chapter 8, verse 5, those are all the partner passages with that text. And uh, Leviticus 19.35 says, You shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, in, in meat yard, uh, in weight or in measure. And Leviticus 19.36 says, Just balances, just weights, and a just ephah, a just hinge shall you have. Talking about measurements and stuff. Same, uh, then verse, uh, Amos chapter 8, verse number 5 says, uh, when will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn in the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great, falsifying the balances by deceit? So when you read that verse, Proverbs chapter 11, verse 1, a false balance is abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. This verse, is, it's literally teaching that a person should not cheat out another person when it comes to, you know, sets of weights, okay? Uh, if you buy $100 worth of spice, or, you know, $100 worth of flour or sugar or coffee or whatever, you better get $100 worth of that product. Uh, you know, you spend $20 on a bag of beef jerky, a five-ounce bag of beef jerky, which is a joke as it is, but you better get five ounces of beef jerky and not four ounces of jerky and one ounce of bag. You know what I'm saying? You see them things. They got this big, massive bag of stuff, and there's only just a little bit of whatever goodies in, at the bottom. They're cheating people, <laughs> people out. Things are getting thinner and smaller and stuff like that. But another thing is, if you tell someone you're going to fix your house, you're going to fix something on their house, or you're going to fix something on their car, well, then you better be uh, straight up and not charge them for the work that you didn't really do. Okay? They've got to be honest in your business. So a false balance, that's, that's cheating people out. Okay, cheating people out, and that's, that's an abomination to God. And for us, you know, no other things when we think of abomination comes to mind. Well, there, there's one of them. You know, most people think of the perverted things. That's one too, but that's another one, a false balance. Now, a false balance, it could also be applied to uh, churches and preachers. Uh, if I got up here and preached on tithing, 
every single week. And if I preached on, on church attendance and, and baptism every single Sunday, uh, and you never heard me preach on topics like the judgment seat of Christ or the second coming of Christ, well, I'd be way out of balance. My, my preaching would become an abomination to God because this, I was talking about the same thing every single week. The preaching would become an abomination. And the days that we're living in, there's so many congregations and ministries out there that are out of balance. And the, the results of that is churches all, all around are, are treading water and pretty much just into survival mode, just trying to stay afloat and survive. And the, the power of God, the, the influence of God, and the, the anointing of God in, the, in most assemblies nowadays, they're gone. And, you know, they used to go back to tell stories on how things used to be in the past. Well, we can't always go back to the past. And, you know, they're, they, they lost the anointing of God. That's, that's scary. Just staying afloat. And I just looked up some, uh, some statistics on this. 2021 Gallup poll revealed another grim number for Christians. Church membership in the U.S. has fallen below 50% for the first time, April 9th, 2023. Uh, Pew Research, 27%. From ages 18 to 27, attend church weekly. 27% of young people are, are in churches. You know, that's, that's slim. 48% are at, 50, are at 65 plus who go to church weekly. Uh, the baby boomers and things like that, you'd call them. And May, 23rd, uh, May of 2023, 31% of U.S. adults said they attend church in the past seven days. Okay, that's adults, everybody. 31% of an adult, you ask people on the street, said, yeah, I, I, I attend church once a week. 31%. That's, that's bad. <laughs> Just above a quarter. Uh, academic research into this topic suggests that in recent years, 1% to 2% of American churches close. Uh, put differently, the best estimate among researchers is that 3,850 to 7,700 congregations are closing every year which works out to around 75 to 150 congregations a week. So since you've been here from last Sunday or last Thursday, that tells me that 75 to 150 churches have closed, have shut down. Congregations, are, they're done, they quit. That's it. Since last time we've been here, a week. And most of the ones that are still functioning today, just, you know, in general, they're spiritually dead. And that's bad. You know, I don't, I don't want to be considered a, a spiritually dead church. Even though we got a couple of people in here, I don't want to be considered that. Okay, now, something very powerful has, has grieved and, and quenched God's presence from our gatherings, from the assemblies. So, the Bible addresses a, a danger here that we can clearly see about having a, an abo a, a, a false balance, which is an abomination to the Lord. So, I believe if we're going to function best as a church, then we have to do to the best of our abilities with the Lord's help, we got to find balance in these three specific areas, okay? Number one, we got to find balance in our convictions, okay? Number two, we got to find balance in our compassions. And then we got to find balance in our refusal to compromise. We got to find balance in these three areas. This is important. You go crazy on, on any of these three areas, and I believe it's one of the results of why you know, churches are without power, churches are dead, they're, they're splitting, things are falling apart, whatever, is because this, they're unbalanced in these three areas, okay? So come to ba back to Matthew chapter 21. Now, the setting, the whole setting of Matthew chapter 21 deals with what we call the triumphal entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem, all right? Jesus Christ, the promised Messiah, he shows up into Jerusalem. There's 46 verses found in this chapter, and it's a very busy portion of Scripture. It pretty much highlights uh, six different events and illustrations within this one chapter. So the Lord Jesus Christ, he, he is seen in this chapter in a, in a very powerful way. You could, you could really analyze, you could look at this chapter and get some uh, aspects of who he is, his character. You could see his temper, okay, number one. You can see his, his purpose, and then you can see his declaration. That is what he, what he stood for. And we're going to look at those three major attributes of, of Jesus and, uh, after he entered into the gate of the city of Jerusalem. And uh, this, this, these all include the, the standard illustration and example of his conviction, his compassion, and his refusal to compromise. So what I, what I hope that this message will accomplish for us is that uh, to help us find some type of spiritual balance, 
that's needed, okay, in our lives in order for those around us to see the Lord in us, uh, you know, to see the Lord Jesus Christ through the ways that we live and, and witness His presence, even when they just come to our church. That's a big deal, all right? So the, the greatest testimony of, 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 of this church and of any Bible believing church should, should be, well, it shouldn't be how beautiful of a building it is. It, it shouldn't be how convenient the parking is. It shouldn't be the big gymnasium or, or you know, whatever. And it's a blessing. It's a, that's a good, good stuff to have. A building, a roof over your head, a good big parking lot, a gymnasium, things like that. That's good. That's all good stuff. But when, you know, you come to the, you come to our church and those, you know, I hope, you know, you're, you're, that, that visit, I hope we're friendly. I hope we're welcoming them and introducing ourselves and, and coming in and talking with them a little bit and things like that. Very basic, friendly type of stuff. But the best thing that people could have when they come to this church and when they go home uh, isn't about the building, isn't about the programs, isn't about the the singing. And people ought to, you know, they ought to be able to get in their car and say, look, I don't understand everything that's going on in there. <laughs> Might be a little weird. Might be you know a couple couple people in here, and you know, and might be small, whatever. Might be outdated. It's kind of strange and stuff. But one thing for sure is the the presence of God was in there, and his in his word was upheld. That'd be great. Somebody drive home and, and say something like that. That'd be wonderful. That's a great testimony to have. So like I said, in order to attain that, and I don't want to be one of those seventy five churches that close down every week, uh, is that we have to find a balance in these important areas, okay? I just want to really, really stress that. And thinking about it, what better example can I use about these these areas other than the Lord Jesus Christ? All right, what, what better example, you know, to, to show these things? Look, so look at Matthew chapter 21. Look at verse number 12. First of all, I want you to notice the Lord's convictions. That's Matthew chapter 21. Look at verse number 12. Um, I, want you to, I want you to notice his his stand, all right, what he, what he took a stand on. And that's a, old, a good old saying is, you know, if, if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. I, I believe that's a good little saying, okay? You don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. you got to stand for something, right? Look what he says in verse 12, verse 12 here. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers, in the seats of them that sold, uh, sold doves. Jesus, he went into the temple of God. Okay, number one. He went into the temple. Just let's stop there for a moment. Notice that when he was going into the temple, he didn't need a crowd. Okay, he didn't need his, uh, his, his denomination's approval. Okay, he didn't have to call up the, Bap the Baptist board and say, look, I'm about to do such and such here. You approve? He didn't have to call up his buddies and say, look, I'm about to do this. You, 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 you coming with me to this service or something? <laughs> he didn't have to do any of that. He, he actually, uh, he's, he, you have to be willing to stand for things even when you are alone. I just like how it just says, Jesus went into the temple. And we could find out, and I believe in John, the disciples might have been there around at this time too, but it just, it just shows Jesus there. So Jesus, he was pretty much willing to be identified as being different. Uh, you know, he, he, uh, he, he was... Um, you know, he, he didn't have no, no people kind of buy him to, to, to approve of what he was about to do. And having convictions, which you ought to have, having conviction, it'll, it'll kind of thin out the buddy system, so to say. And it'll cause people to misrepresent you. And it might even cause people to, to lie about you. And, the, you know, they may take things that you say out of context, you know, with the motive of just trying to make you look bad. That's what people will do when you got convictions. So when you got a conviction that lines up with God's word, you got to be willing to stand on what you believe. And, and if, even, even if everybody else around you disagrees with you, all right? Uh, he, he didn't, like I said, he didn't ask his disciples, should I, should I go into the temple today and flip tables? <laughs> no, he, he didn't even say that. And uh, people, you know, nowadays they don't have many convictions because they're, they're, they can't handle the loneliness that accompanies having convictions, uh, and, or, and even the rejection that comes along with taking a stand for things. Okay, you know, it's a, another thing about this passage is other preachers were in this temple. You had the chief priests; they were there. Uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were all in this in this temple. But isn't it strange? Out of all the preachers and all the religious people that were sitting in this temple, hanging around. Nobody had, to, had, had enough convictions to, to, to do something about, you know, what was going on in the temple. 
And, uh, you know, instead of those preachers getting on Jesus' side, they got mad for, for what he did, uh, for Jesus taking a stand, because it made them look bad. It made them look weak and, you know, spiritually anemic, because, man, I, I, we should have been the ones doing that, and we weren't. So they got, they got mad at the Lord Jesus Christ for doing that. So his convictions, you have to see that the, the Lord was willing to stand by himself. So you ought to understand that. There may be some isolation, some, you know, just taking a stand, regardless of the whole crowd goes this way, i got to stand on what the Word of God says. i got to be over here, okay? That, thank you, Frank. So uh, look at verse number 12 here. Verse number 12. And cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple. Okay, cast out even them that sold doves. Okay, it talks about doves. And uh, even going back to the earlier days, you know, nowadays it still kind of carries that meaning. A dove always symbolized, you know, peace and love and acceptance. And that's, that's general, you know, that's general. And even if that, you know, that little symbolism there, you know, he, he said, look, I, I'm not even going to hang around and deal with that crowd <laughs> in a way that just, just constantly emphasizes love, peace, and acceptance. There comes a time where I have to have righteous indignation. I got to flip tables. I don't care how, oh, I'm selling peaceful little doves. I'm, everything's fine. No, it might, it might not be. Okay. So sometimes uh, in your separation, uh, as a result of your stand, you have to get some people or some things out of your life. That's, that's part of your stand. That's, that's part of your separation. So he over, look what he said. He overthrew the tables of the money, the money changers and the seats. So not only did he flip the tables, uh, but also the, the seats where he flipped, he took the chairs and flipped the chairs over too. Wonder why he did that. Probably because he, he was willing to take a stand and say, I'm not identifying, I'm not sitting down with a bunch of people that are doing that. So look, you don't got a table no more, you don't got seats anymore. If you're if all you want to do is sit around, you're not willing to take a stand. All right, so he flipped he flipping the flipping the, the, the chairs too. And then he then look at this part. Look what he says. Uh, how it says he he cast out. I circled that word cast. Okay, he cast them out of the temple. That's a that's a very powerful Bible word to use. All right, and uh, you know you, do you know how that that word is used? In the Bible, I'll give you just a couple, uh, couple references. The Bible says, "Cast out the bondwoman and her son. Uh, cast out the beam in your own eye. Cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping, uh, gnashing of teeth. Cast into the fiery furnace of earth. Cast out and trodden underfoot. Cast it to the dogs. Cast into hell." So it holds that word "cast." It holds the implication of throwing something away one time and never having that thing come back again. <laughs> That's what that, that's what that, that a powerful word, he cast it out. And then the last time that that Bible word shows up is in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 15. It says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. It's a powerful word to, to use in that thing. So in other words, once and for all, never to be returned to the previous state again. If I'm going to do this, I'm going to make a scene, flip tables and flip chairs. I'm, I'm casting this stuff out. I don't ever want this coming back again. Just like if a person gets cast into hell, into outer darkness, whatever, they're never going to return to that previous state. It's a done, that's, a, that's a done deal there. So the Lord Jesus Christ, in his separation, he said, look, we're not, we're not just doing this, you know, this Sunday. This isn't just a one-time revival meeting, church thing. This, this is from now on forever is what he, what he wanted this, okay? And, uh, you know, the Lord, he made his, he made his separation he was willing to be made laughed at. What do you think people thought of him when he did that? You know, people probably say, look at the guy. He lost his mind. He's a fool. What a, that's a, uh, coming into church, and a guy starts flipping the, going to the Catholic church, and I'm flipping the communion tables. I'm pouring out the juice and stuff. <laughs> Don't ever do that. You'd look like a fool, okay, doing something like that. But this is the Lord Jesus Christ here. He had a, he had a purpose for, for doing some, something like this. And another reason why people don't want to take a stand is because they they just they refuse to identify with Jesus Christ. They don't want to identify with the Lord, and they're you know they don't want to identify and say I'm going to stand for what's right, I'm going to stand for anything that's wrong, and I'm going to stand for the Word of God. I'm going to stand for the Lord Jesus Christ, even if I have to do it alone, right? So uh, I want you to notice his his steadfastness. All right, he was steadfast. Go to John. Okay, keep a bookmark in Matthew. Come back to it. 
But go to the Gospel of John. Look at John chapter 2. This is the same thing. Another uh, more detail, a little bit more detail in John. John writes about the same event. Look at John chapter 2, verse number 13. Number one, whose temple was that to begin with? It was the Lord's temple. He said, my house. This is it. God instituted that temple. The religious people got carried away with it. So it was, you know, that's why it was all right for him to do it. You know, he, it was his to begin with. This building ain't your, yours. This building ain't mine. You know, stuff, that's, that's different. But it was the Lord's house, that, that thing here. But look at John chapter 2 here, verse number uh, 13. John chapter 2, verse 13. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. That's what they're doing. Everybody's sitting. Nobody's taking a stand. You see, everybody's just sitting around. And when he had made, look at this, he made a scourge of small cords. Whatever was around vines, he made something. He, he made a scourge of small cords and drove them all out of the temple and the sheep, and the oxen, and poured out the money changers and overthrew the tables. <laughs> so, he literally made a whip. And, you, you know, you read some of your uh, liberal commentators and stuff, they'll say, well, he just made a whip just to drive out the animals. I don't see that. I don't believe that. I, I like how it says, he drove them all out of the temple with the whip that he just made. I believe he's whipping people out of this temple too. He, uh, he Out of the temple and... The sheep. He's whipping the, the people first. Get out of here. Get, you know, I don't know if he's beating them and whipping them, but that'll strike some fear. Get, get out. Get out of here. He's, then, then he's smacking the animals too. Because why? I believe probably because then people are acting like a bunch of animals too. You're, you're making this temple filthy. You know, it, it stinks. It's dirty. You're turning this into a pig pen. This isn't what this temple was supposed to be. I'm going to treat you all like a bunch of animals. He's whipping, he's whipping everybody out of the, out of the thing. All right, and, uh, and then, you know, that money guys, they're, they're making the Lord's house look like a bingo hall. You know, they're making the Lord's house look like some carnival, some fairground. <laughs> Do we know any churches that ever, no, we don't know any churches that ever did that before. <laughs> That's St. John's. Go right down to their, their St. John's Fair, get gambling and, and putting, you know, money in the thing at a churchyard. If the Lord saw that stuff, he would have flipped them things over. You ain't gambling on my, you know, shooting dice or, or ping pong or whatever and winning money. At, 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 a, at a supposed church, what, what are you? What are you doing? <laughs> now look, look at the look at the basis of the Lord's conviction. Look at look at verse number sixteen. He says, "And said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, get out of here." In other words, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. You're 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 selling. You're making money in the church in the temple. Off of lost people just coming in, having a you know good time and stuff. Something something's off with that. And then look, and then his disciples remembered. You know they're they're probably in shock. I can't believe what I just saw at church today. <laughs> you know then they then they, <laughs> they come to them. Then they remembered that look, it was written. You see that the scripture. It was written. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Oh, what, that's amazing. Uh, you know what a what a what a uh, passage there. So the basis of his scripture, or his basis of his conviction, was what was it was written, was scripture. So look at Matthew chapter twenty one. Okay, we'll go back to Matthew twenty one, same account. Matthew chapter twenty one, verse thirteen, and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. So I like how that kind of works. One passage is, you know, the, the disciples remembered what he said, and this one says he said it. And that might happen sometimes when you hear preaching or something, you know. I might be saying something, and you're already thinking of, I remember the verse before he even gets to it at times. That's, that's the blessing of knowing, knowing the Bible. But anyways, what was the basis of his conviction? It was, it is written. It was written. So the Word of God. So if what we're doing, if what we're doing wasn't against the, if what the Lord was doing, uh, if it, if it wasn't according to what the Word of God said, if he wasn't fulfilling something, then Jesus Christ was wrong. But if what he was doing was in accordance with the Scripture, then he's right, and he's right. Let's just look at Jeremiah real quick. I'll show you the two Old Testament verses. Look at Jeremiah chapter 7. Turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 7. 
Jeremiah chapter 7, verse number 11. Okay, let's look at this verse. So Jesus Christ quoted it. He said it is written, so he must be quoting something. All right, so what's he quoting? He's going to go back to the Old Testament book of Jeremiah, page 997. All right, look at Jeremiah chapter 7, verse number 11. Look what it says. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. He saw it back in, what is it, 600 B.C., 600 B.C. And uh, it's interesting how the Lord saw it back then and then He shows up in the flesh. God Almighty shows up in the form of a man, shows up in the form of flesh. And, and He goes to the temple. He's seeing it firsthand. All right? Now come to Isaiah chapter uh, 40 or 56, book of Isaiah, a book to the left. You Jeremiah, go to Isaiah, a book to the left. Look at Isaiah chapter 56. Look at verse number 7. Isaiah 56, verse number 7. How about this? Isaiah 56, verse 7. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. That's what it's supposed to be. And their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar. Okay. Then, then, it's, then there's a semicolon. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. That's a blessing. I've got some future application in the, in the millennial temple and things like that. Uh, but that, you know, the Lord, the Lord takes that verse and applies it practically at, at that time period even. You, you made this house like a den of robbers. You're making merchandise. You're turning this into some casino, some gambling hall. This ain't supposed to be. It's supposed to be a house of prayer here. So he, he, that's what we call righteous indignation. Okay. Now this also shows you that his, his conviction, it was a scriptural conviction. So... To turn it on to us now, to turn it and point the finger at you guys and me, okay? Uh, anytime we're whipping people over the head when they're not explicitly disobeying Scripture, then you're out of line, okay? We got we got to get that. We got this, you know, we got this thing in Christianity that you know we we compare how many convictions you have and how many convictions I have, and uh, and you know we have this checklist, and if I have more convictions than you have, I'm more spiritual than you. <laughs> That's that's what we, we tend to do, okay? And uh, there's 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 two definitions that you're here throwing around when it comes to convictions that you're here here in the Bible Baptist, you know, King James uh, only Bible believing Baptist crowd and all that. You're here that you're here these two terms getting thrown around: legalist and liberal. Okay, you're here you're here them thrown around. So a legalist is pretty much anybody who has one more conviction than I have. <laughs> that makes them a legalist. And then a liberal is somebody that has one less conviction than I have. And it, it makes them liberal, which ain't, ain't, ain't right. You know, that might, that might not be anywhere in the Bible. It's not nowhere in the Bible, but that's how we tend to think sometimes. And if, uh, you know, if you think that everybody doesn't believe what you believe and have the same conviction that you believe, then you're carnal or, you know, they, they, they need to get some spirituality into them and stuff like that. And then once they get a conviction that, that you don't have, then you tend to say, oh, you're taking it too far now. You know, like you were just trying to get them to get to your convictions and then they one upped you and now they're a legalist. <laughs> so, you know, there's, there's all kinds of weird, kooky stuff going on. So, another thing Christians like to do, uh, uh, Dr. Sam Gipp always says this one, is he says a lot of Christians always, they always want to do that. They want to play uh, conviction poker. Okay? In other words, that, you know, I see your conviction and I'll raise you two more. I'll raise you two more. <laughs> you know, I'll double down on you. Now, I'm more spiritual than you because I got two more convictions than you got. You know, it's like, well, what is this? It shouldn't be like that. So, there's the, we're going to look at real quick four different kinds of convictions in the Bible. Right? And I'm not saying that there, you know, there's only just four convictions. You could, you could make your checklist of your convictions and you'll find out there's way more. I got way more than four convictions. But you'll find that most of your convictions are going to fall under these four categories of convictions. All right? Number one. Turn to Acts chapter 8 real quick. Acts chapter 8. Now, number one, we got, a, we got a scriptural conviction. A scriptural conviction. We'll keep it simple. So what's a scriptural conviction? Well, it's something that you did not believe until you saw it in the Bible or something that you believed and then you saw it was contrary to what the Bible said and you changed it. So, for example, a scriptural conviction would be Acts chapter 8 Let's see, look at verse number 28. 
I remember that servant guy. He's in his chariot. He's reading. He's reading the. He's reading the book of Isaiah, the book that we just turned from. He was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understand thou what thou readest? He said, How can I except some men should guide me? So you go on with it and place the scripture, you know, goes on with it, tells him who it is. Verse 33, uh, let's see. Verse 34, The eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? So he's reading Isaiah, you know, verse 53. He's saying, is this Isaiah or is this talking about some other man? Well, Philip opened his mouth and began at the same time preached preach unto him Jesus. All right? Preach unto him Jesus. And uh, let's see here. Verse 36. And as they went on their way, there came a certain water. And, you, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's a scriptural conviction. He had to see it in the scripture and expound it. Who's this guy? Here it's talking about. Let's talk about Jesus. He saw in the scripture, he believed, okay, uh, on the Lord Jesus Christ. Another scriptural conviction is before I was saved, I used to think salvation was by works. I used to think I could work my way to heaven. If I'm just a good person and I try to be good to people and whatever, then I'll, I'll make it to heaven. You're going to go to hell. You can't go to heaven by your good works. And I thought that I, until... <laughs> I read the Bible, and it said, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's a free gift. God offers it. You have to take it by faith and trust it. I can't, you don't work for a free gift. You receive it and trust what God did for you, okay? So that's a scriptural conviction. Uh, something that, that you did not believe until you saw it in the scripture. Or something that you were doing, you know, like purgatory. Well, that's not in the scripture. And then you read in the scripture, purgatory is not in the scripture. That's a, so then you switched and now you believe the scripture. You have a conviction that's false. That's not in there. So you, you switched and you got that. So that's a scriptural conviction. Now come to Acts chapter 16. Next one is we got a spiritual conviction. Spiritual conviction. Now this would be something that the Holy Spirit convicts you of. Um, you know, and that's what a, a conviction is something that you can be convicted by the Holy Spirit. Something pricks you. You know, you're doing something wrong. Something, you know, that, that, that sense of, of guilt in a way. It's a conviction. You're a convicted, you know, felon or it's, it's a charge that's brought upon you by, through certain means and stuff. So, uh, we'll call this one a, a spiritual conviction. Now look at Acts chapter 16. Let's go to verse number, let's see. Acts chapter 16. Let's see, where we're at. Let's go to let's go to let's start at verse number six. How about this? And Paul going around on his missionary journeys and stuff. Acts chapter 16, verse number six. Now, when they had gone throughout Phygeria uh, in the region of Galatia, ain't that interesting? You know, we have a we have a book of book written to the book of Galatians. We we could have maybe had a book of the uh, Phy, Phy Gerins, but we, I guess we don't. So we have the book of Galatia, the Galatians. In the region of Galatia, but look at this, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After they were come to uh, Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Spirit didn't allow them. Look at verse 8. And they, pa and they passing by Messiah came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to the, uh, Paul in a the night. There stood a man of Macedonia. Remember we read about that in Corinthians, Macedonian? Macedonia, and look, and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly God that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel unto them. So, ain't that something? So, a spiritual conviction is when the Holy Spirit stops you from doing something that you intended to do um, or, or makes you do something different that you, know, that, that, that you weren't going to do or whatever. So, Apostle Paul, he was going to go preach to Asia. Uh, he meant well. He was going to try to get the gospel into, into Asia. But the Holy Spirit said no. 
It stopped him. It forbid him to go to Asia. That's, spiritual, that's a spiritual conviction. Now, any conviction that, that you get that isn't scriptural, you're going to want to try to throw it under this category. You're going to try to want to say, well, it's spiritual. It's a, we're going to put it back on the Holy Spirit. You're going, to, you're going to try doing that at times, okay? But, you know, so, so here's the problem here. here. Here's a problem. When Paul got this revelation from God, uh, you know, he, he did not go into Asia because he was forbidden. He went into Macedonia. And then when he got into Macedonia, he was preaching the gospel to everybody and, and things like that. And then, and then he was preaching the sin of going into Asia. And then he was breaking fellowship with anybody who was going into Asia. <laughs> he didn't do that. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm teasing. He, he didn't do that. Uh, of course he didn't do that. Okay, uh, but you think of it, isn't, isn't that sometimes what we tend to do? Notice that the Holy Spirit stopped him from doing something. And that's what you hate, that's what I hate, is when the Holy Spirit stops you from doing something and then allows somebody else to do it. So, you know, what's, what's that about? You know, then we say, well, you know, wait a minute, the Holy Spirit, you know, the Holy Spirit didn't stop him, uh, then you know, why is he stopping me from doing that? You start questioning things. Come to Acts chapter 19, I'll show you what I mean. Come to Acts chapter 19 here. I had a spiritual conviction. You, could you imagine, though, because the Spirit told Paul, don't go to Asia, and then Paul got to Macedonia, and he's preaching, anybody that goes to Asia is backslidden, wicked, you know, this is, I mean, can you imagine if he started preaching that spiritual conviction that he got? You know, so just think about that. He'd, he'd be wrong. Look at Acts 19, verse number 1. All right, Acts 19. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coasts, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples. Well, wait a minute. Ephesus? What's it say in the book of Revelation where that church is located? to the seven churches which are in Asia. <laughs> the church of Ephesus, Smyrna, Thyatira, all the rest of them. So wait a minute, you know, uh, that's, you know, Paul, where, where's Paul at right now? He's in Asia, <laughs> okay? Uh, is that, but is it contrary to the Holy Spirit? Well, no, actually, no. Uh, it, it wasn't a sin to go to Asia, uh, but it would have been if the Spirit would have told him, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't go into Asia, go into Macedonia. And then at that time, he went to, Macedonia, or he went to Asia, it would have been a sin. But in other words, he, he already, once he went to Macedonia, which we read, remember, in Acts chapter 16, he fulfilled that. Then the Holy Spirit kind of gave him leave to, okay, now you can go to, now you can go to Asia. But, you know, at, at, uh, at that time, I didn't want you to, okay? So, I'll, I'll just give you an example here. You know, some people have a conviction about not going into a restaurant that serves booze, okay? And uh, I don't have that, that conviction. I don't. <laughs> but I'll tell you, you know, the, the, you know, the only restaurant that the Holy Spirit really impressed upon me and, and my wife, uh, that we walked in that place and we said, we don't belong here, <laughs> was Burgatory. <laughs> Out of all places, we, we, we walked into that place, we looked around, we saw some thing work. I didn't know what it was. I couldn't tell what it was. You looked around, you see pitchforks on the wall, you see flame, flames, you see these weird religious innuendos and stuff all going around. And we looked at each other and we said, we got to get out of here. <laughs> okay, I can't, I don't know, you know. I feel like I'm in the pagan meat market and I'm going to sit down and eat a hamburger in hell. <laughs> we got to go, you know. And we did. We, we turned right around we sat in a car and said, man, that place was weird. <laughs> okay. And I was trying one to try their bison burger and stuff like that, whatever it was. I heard they had different kinds of stuff. And we walked out, you know, we went, and, I don't know, ate somewhere else down the road. Now, you know, we, we just didn't belong there, okay? But there's places like, you know, Patron's and Texas Roadhouse and Pasqualino's and, and Mission Barbecue and Tape Tokyo. Those are our go-tos. That's, that's, where, that's, where that's where we like to go. And uh, I don't have no, no conviction. You know, they serve alcohol there in them places. But look, we tell them this too. Don't well, let's not sit near the bar. And they try to put me near the bar. I said, no, no, we got to go sit over here. Let's put me away from the bar, please. And they will every time. Yeah, that's that's they'll, they'll do that. Okay, so you won't see me eating a hamburger at the bar and drinking a root beer at the bar. I got a conviction against. It. I'm not going to do that because it's an appearance of evil. But when it comes to the thing of I'm not going to go to that restaurant because they sell alcohol. I'm not giving my money to a bunch of wicked people, alcohol. And if you go into that restaurant, you're not spiritual. I'm more spiritual than you because I have that one more conviction. 
then then it's 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 troublesome. Okay, it's troublesome. So uh, you know, Christians will say, "Well, you're out of the will of God. You know, you're you, you're not you're not spiritual and stuff." You can't do that. You can't do that to people. So now, Paul. You go back to Paul. He was going into Asia to preach the gospel, and uh, wasn't that a noble cause to think about it? Yeah, it was. That was a noble cause. He was going to preach the gospel, and the Holy Spirit said no. What if Paul would have went and came back and told all his buddies how great of a meeting he had? Man, brother, we just had 5,000 souls one to the Lord that night. It was a great time in Asia. Holy Spirit told me not to go, but we got people saved. <laughs> it would have been wrong. You see that? It would have, it would have been wrong. You know, who would have been right? <laughs> the Holy Spirit, the, the third member of the Godhead, or the Apostle Paul, just because he got a bunch of souls saved. In that case, it still would have been of course Paul would have been wrong. But he didn't do that. He obeyed. All right. Now look at this. Look at verse number nine, uh, Acts chapter 19. Look at verse number 8. All right. Acts 19, verse number 8. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things of the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened. There you go, Jeanette. There's that word divers showing up again, huh? When divers, okay, different kinds, various. When divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannius. It'd be like your college, you know. Every, uh, every college, Harvard and Princeton and Yale, and they always have people that founded them schools. They name them after their names. Well, here they got the school of Tyrannius back in the day. Look at verse 10. And this continued by the space of two years, so that, uh, so that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Isn't that amazing? The, all in Asia heard the word of the Lord in the space of two years. Look at that. No books, no tracks, no radio ministry, <laughs> none of that. And all that were in Asia heard the word of the Lord at that time. Just by Paul obeying the Holy Spirit, and uh, he, got, he got the whole word of the Lord out. And I don't think that would have been said if he would have disobeyed the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 16 and went. The Holy Spirit knew exactly what was going on there. I'm going to give you a better opportunity. Go to this place first. Answer that one guy who called you, you know, that Macedonian that vision. Go to him first. Then you go to Asia, you'll see a good harvest. You're gonna, the, the word of God is going to get scattered out uh, by word of mouth somehow. It's amazing, you know. Uh, Every, the whole, whole, all of Asia heard the word of the Lord. That's, that's, that's amazing. So, uh, you know, uh, a spiritual conviction is when the Spirit intercepts you and He tells you, you don't belong here. It's, it's, it's the wrong time. I, don't, I, want you, I want you to go here. Stay away from that place. You know, go, go this way for now, okay? Now, sometimes the Holy Spirit will use a, a preacher to convict you. And some preachers, you know, uh, they, they, they know that when they can't convict you, then they start using intimidation. And that's wrong. They're starting intimidating you. So how, how, can you, how can you tell the difference of a conviction versus an intimidation? Well, uh, you know that it's a conviction by the Holy Spirit. When you hear something that I say, or whatever preacher you listen to, and you say, you know, man, I've I got I to gotta change some things in my life to please God. That's how you know it's a conviction. And that's something that you can't, you know, them preachers you listen to online, they don't know you. <laughs> you know, yeah, so, it, you know, it's different when you hear me say something uh, and you walk out, I got to change, not because of him up there preaching, you know, but I got to change because God wants me to change. I'm convicted of, of, of something. And then it's an, it's an intimidation when you pretty much walk out of here and say, man, I got to change because that preacher's on to me. And I got to make sure he's not preaching to me and thinks that I'm the bad guy in, of who he's preaching to. So I got to change for him. N no. Then, 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 it's, uh, then it's intimidation. So, you know, when, when you're, don't try to impress the preacher or anything like that. You, you're, you're doing it because of, of God. You want to impress God, okay? Forget about me, honestly. Now, then you have this. Come to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. All right, so we got a scriptural conviction. All right, we got a, a spiritual conviction. All right, we got a spiritual conviction. Now come to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 
Look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 14. All right, now the next one is a natural conviction. All right, look at 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 14. How about this verse? 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him. Ain't that something? If a man, if a, it, a, 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 it doesn't say the Holy Spirit tells a man that if you have long hair, it's a shame. You don't, you don't need the Holy Spirit for that, actually. And uh, nature tells you that. Men are natural fighters. I don't care what you say about it. Right? You're saved. You know, we still got the tendency of sometimes getting hot-headed, and, and there's some hot blood, red blood in us, and stuff that we want to fight. That's you know, I'm not saying a, a preacher, a pastor should be no, not swift, to, not a brawler, not a striker. Okay, so there's times we gotta exercise our patience and stuff, but it's natural. First thing when a man goes to war, what do they do when you get in? A, you go to the army. You cut your hair, man. They skin you bald. They don't want you having long hair flown around in a battlefield and stuff like that. And that's what happened with Absalom, right? You read that in the book of David's son. The guy had five pounds of hair. That's a lot of hair when he weighed that thing in the, in the scale. He, he's out there battling on a horse, and his hair got wrapped up in a tree. And what happened to him? Then Jehu or Joab or whoever come up and stabbed him with a spear. That was the death of him. <laughs> that guy's long hair, you know, so... It tells you this, it's natural for men to have, uh, not to have long hair, a natural conviction here. So before I got saved, I had my long hair. <laughs> and, I, and, and it was called back in that day, it was called the man bun. All right? I'm glad that that trend kind of <laughs> faded away. I had this big three-pound man bun sometimes on my head. What, what, what was going on? A man bun. I mean, geez. So when I, got, when I first got saved, there I was, you know, donated all, 28 inches, 28 inch long, thick, curly-looking hair. And I got saved, and I'm studying my Bible, and, uh, and I came to this verse here. I'm reading, and I got my, my dreadlocks draped down over, over, over my Bible here, okay? And I'm reading this verse. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? And I sat back, I'm thinking, man, Lord, you know, what, what, you know what's, what's this about, you know? And so I'm thinking, though, eventually I can't, I, I did, I come to my senses, and uh you know, what what I do? I, I cut my hair. I end up cutting my hair. And I, you know, I had hair routines and taking care of it and coconut oils and conditioners. And what the, what was I doing? I got, I got like educated into that. Because at first, nature should have told me, this is not natural to have this thing. I'm working in 90 degree heat in the summer. I got this mop on my head. I'm sweating. It's not, it's not natural. Okay? There's, some, there's something about that. Now, in Paul's day, you know what was the, the haircut of Paul's day? He looked around and saw all these Romans and, 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 and Gentiles. You know what the haircut was? It was the Caesar. <laughs> that's, and that's still what it is to this day, <laughs> is the Caesar cut. That's what I go and get my haircut at Supercuts. Give me the Caesar cut. I went high on the top, short on the sides. Right, Luke? <laughs> John Paul? I mean, another guy, you know, Tone? I don't know what Tone got. I'm no, just kidding about that. <laughs> <laughs> just that's well, you know what I'm saying. We, that's to this day. You look around; most they got the the high on the top and the short on the sides. That's that's called that's actually called a Caesar cut. <laughs> From what? Where did they get that? From the Roman Caesars. Okay. Now the 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 point is this: is the, there's some things that you don't actually even need a Bible to tell you that some things are wrong. That's a natural conviction. Nature tells you that. Hey, let's go look at another one. Look at Romans chapter. Uh, one. Look at verse number 26. Look at Romans chapter 1. A couple books to the left. One book to the left. Look at Romans chapter 1. Look at verse number 26. Uh, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. Vile. That's nasty. Vile affections. That's where your heart is. You know, affections come from our heart. You don't want to be in love with something that's vile. Okay? A vile affection. Now look at this. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. How about that? And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in lust one toward another. How about this? Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves the recompense of their error, which was meat. 
That don't work. It's, it's disgusting. It's vile. You get AIDS and, and grid and sexual diseases. And, and that's what it says there. It's a, 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 a woman leaving the natural use into that which is against nature. So nature tells you that homosexuality is wrong. It's, uh, nature tells you that from the get-go. You put them all on one side, the whole race would become extinct. If that's how God intended it to be, okay, it, there would be no mankind. You can't populate that. Okay? So it's a sexual perversion. It's, it's, it's vile. Okay? So that's one that tells you that uh, uh, that's, that sin right there is a, it's a natural conviction. You almost don't need the Bible for that conviction. Okay, then we have another one. Look at John. Look at John chapter 8 real quick. We'll go hurry up. John chapter 8, verse number 9. Uh, let's see here. John chapter 8. This is, remember the, the whole de uh, ordeal about uh, the woman caught in adultery? These Pharisees take this woman and they bring her to Jesus to you know, throw her on the ground or whatever and say, let's kill her. You know, we caught her in, a, in the act of adultery. Uh, you know, of course, you know, how, where's the guy at? You know, that's you should, you're, if you caught that person in the act of adultery, that man's just as guilty. You should have took him too. So they, that could have been a setup. It could have been one of the Pharisees hooking up with her or whatever. A bunch of weird stuff going on with that. But look at John chapter 8, look at verse number 9. And then, you know, at the end of it, well, verse 7. He that is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote it on the ground. And when they heard it, being convicted... By their own conscience, they went out one by one, beginning at the eldest. So that, there's something there. Is you know when you there's a conviction when you try uh, when you try to set up someone. That's what I believe they were doing to the Lord. They're trying to set them up. You know they're always trying to do that. And they're under a conviction by your own conscience. God gave us that our, our conscience, a natural thing to to help us make decisions and discern what's right, what's what's wrong, things like that. Uh, come to Second Timothy. Come to 2 Timothy, verse number 3. Here's another one. I don't, think, I don't think you need a Bible to actually tell you that abortion's wrong. I don't think, I don't think you need a Bible to, to tell you that taking a life inside the womb or outside of the womb is wrong. You're taking a life. It's, it's murder. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, page 1590. 2 Timothy chapter 3. How about this one? Let's see. We're not going to read the whole list, but look at verse number three. Talking about people in the last days. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. Then look at verse number three. Without natural affection. So it's, it's, it's natural affection for a woman to love her child. It's something that should be natural. But now, you know, nowadays, you know, it says in the last days, people are going to be without natural affection. So that kind of implies, well then, during the time, you know, back in the good old days or whatever, is the women, they, they had a, a, some type of affection that was naturally there for that child in their womb. You know, born or, or unborn. There's a natural affection that should be there. Now, there's something that you need to know, and it should be evident to you, what you need to know about natural convictions is that they can be educated out of you. Okay, you, they, they can be educated out of you. Your, your nature can be perverted, and that's the goal of public education, flat out, uh, is to educate the natural convictions out of you. To where, there I am, five, six years ago, hair down here, w w you know, weird as can be, it should have been natural for me to say, this ain't, this, this ain't weird, this ain't right. You know, it's, 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 there's something off about that, you know, and you know, killing an unborn child. Now they're telling schools, "Oh, go ahead, do whatever you want to do." I mean, it's it's a uh, uh, you know, if two here's another, if 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 two adults choose to be homosexual, it's their decision. Okay, it's still a sin, but yeah, you have a, don't try to tell me it's not a sin or nothing. But when you have a bunch of five year olds in kindergarten, and and you bring in some pervert that's wearing makeup and then wants to dress and come up in a dress and talk all nice and sweet. I'd, it would give me nightmares and come and, and, and read little stories to little children and tell them, you know what, you can experiment. You may, be, you may be gay too. You need to experiment. You may like boys. You may like girls. That's child abuse. <laughs> that's child abuse. It is. You know, and that's what are they trying to, and then, you know, the media 
comes up and they, you know, they, then they write reports about it and, and they make this seem like this is some big grand thing because a sex pervert just talked about sexual preferences with a bunch of five-year-olds and whatever, you know, six, seven, eight-year-old kids. That's, that's horrible. And, uh, you know, a whole town claps about it, makes a big deal. You can get educated out of natural convictions. Uh, you know, we, we tend to think that there's only, you know, two, two types of people in the world. We think there's moral people, and we think there's immoral people. That's what we generally think. But, you know, a, a moral person is somebody that knows what's right, and I do what's right. That's moral person. And then an immoral person is somebody that knows what's right, and then they do wrong. Okay, but then we're raising a generation of, and what really is, it's amoral. I mean, you know, atheist means there's no God. You know, if, if you're amoral, you know what that means? No morals. They don't even know what's good or bad. They don't even know. That's, that's a generation. That's, that's, that's scary. And anybody that tries teaching that to a kid, that we, that, that's child abuse. You almost deserve to get thrown in jail for doing stuff like that. Okay, so... It, just have a warning. You can be educated out of your natural conviction. Now, how about another one? Another conviction. Come to John chapter, uh, John chapter twelve. John chapter twelve. Look at verse number three. Uh, here's an another one. Now, this about this other conviction. Here's kind of you know where the knowledge of, of our Bible. You know, we know we know we already know we're going to know this passage, and it kind of distorts the way that we look at this passage here. You know, we already kind of go into it with a bias right away. Look at John chapter 12. Let's see here. Verse number, John chapter 12, verse number 3. All right. I like this one. This is a good, good one. Um, they made a supper. Martha served. Lazarus w was one of them that sat at the table uh, with him. That's amazing. You know, just raising from dead and he's sitting down having fellowship with him and stuff. Verse 3. Then took Mary a pound of of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? What are you doing? We could have just sold that, you know? So the next one, I'm going to call this one a intellectual conviction. Something that's intellectual. Uh, now, you see, n nobody knew at this time. We, we think right away, you know, that's stinking Judas. He's a traitor. We, he's up to no good. We know we, that's what we tend to think when we read that. Because we, we have knowledge that the disciples didn't have at the time. They heard this man. They said, man, this guy's spiritual. He's, he's thinking of the poor. <laughs> you know, you would be, well, we watch out for people always talking about the poor. The poor. I mean, how about the poor? The poor. That guy can just be after your money. <laughs> You know, that's what politicians do to get votes. The poor, the poor, the poor. They're, they're, they could be a traitor, you know. So we got to watch out for people. But this is like an intellectual conviction. So you have a scriptural conviction where the Word tells you something. The Word of God tells you something. You have a spiritual conviction. Like I said, you know, for me, I have a spiritual conviction. You don't belong in purgatory. <laughs> I got out there. Certain things, a spiritual conviction. Uh, then you have a, a natural conviction that, you know, you don't really need the Holy Spirit. And that kind of might sound crazy, but in a way, you almost don't need the Holy Spirit. It should be, does not nature itself teach you? Natural convictions, okay? Uh, and then there's an into, intellectual conviction, which is basically this. It's just my opinion. It's, a, it's almost opinions. And, uh, this, and what we like to do is, we like to take our intellectual opinion, or our intellectual convictions, and then move them over into spiritual convictions. And, you know, that's kind of like just sanctifying our opinions. <laughs> you know, if we have sanctified opinions. No, we, we, we can't do that. So an intellectual conviction, uh, it, and this isn't to say that all intellectual convictions are bad either. Uh, so, you know, but just don't assign them to a scriptural conviction. You got to get that. They're, they're in, it's intellectual. And don't blame them. It's the Holy Spirit telling me this. No, it's just your, it's your intellect. And don't require everybody else to have your intellectual conviction. So, you know, I have an intellectual conviction of this. I believe you should read three chapters of, of the Old Testament every day, a proverb a day, and two chapters of the New Testament. 
That's my intellectual conviction. Uh, you know, and, and I, there's no scripture on that. I don't got no scripture on that. You're, you're not, you know, you're, you're not going to be unspiritual by not doing that. Uh, but I, I can guarantee you this. You better read it. You better read something. And uh, I, I just believe that system works. And I'm not going to judge you and judge your spirituality by, you know, if you follow my intellectual idea. I, I can't do that. Now, come to First Timothy. You know, we all have intellectual uh, convictions. Come to First Timothy. It's page number 1583. First Timothy chapter 4. Now, the condition of your conscience will affect your, con your convictions. Okay? In other words, our conscience, you know, God gives us a conscience to help us with these things. Uh, but if your conscience is messed up and seared, you're not going to have much convictions. Okay? So, 1 Timothy chapter 4, let's say, let's go to verse number uh, 1. <clears throat> now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times, all right, circle it, underline it, highlight it, the latter times, so we got the time period down, some shall depart from the faith. The faith. What's the, what's the faith? That's the saving faith of God. You know, and, and we, you know we, like to look at this, we like to look at this passage and say, ah, oh, that's the Catholics. Ah, oh, that's the Seventh-day Adventists. Those people were never in the faith to begin with. <laughs> so it has to talk, it has to talk about it has to be talking about us. King James, Bible believing, dispensational, you know, crossing the T's, dotting the I's, and all that. Our crowd. It has to be talking about true believers, right? So uh, uh, that's, that's who it's talking about. Look what it says here. Giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy. You could go spend all night on that. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron, just nerve damage, just, uh, take, imagine taking an iron to a part of your brain that helps you distinguish what's right from wrong because you got it so messed up and you just sear your conscience. That's bad. Your decision making screwed up, everything starts to f f fall down, go down a drain and stuff, making bad decisions. Your conscience seared with a hot iron. Look at the two specific things though. Forbidding to marry. Now, uh, some way, sometimes, this is going to somehow creep up in, within our true believers, those that are saved, the faith. This is going to creep up into in our churches. All right? Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving and know the truth. So, something is creeping into the churches and if you don't believe me you could go out and talk to other preachers and pastors uh go talk to some guys when we go down who's coming down on february anybody go on saturday i'm gonna i'm definitely making it saturday going to that, that meeting i'm gonna we're gonna make it uh to andrew Schluter's too on on the 21st go talk to them see you know see what's going on what, what's what's kind of messing up the, the the churches and stuff like that one thing that's creeping in is is about this this conviction of, of eating meat you know meats of the devil you're, you're here that. And, uh, you know, you, you could preach on, you know, I don't believe anybody should eat pork. And you're, you may get some amens in the crowd. And then you hit them with, that just leaves more for me. <laughs> and then, you, and then you, you know, you cause some trouble and stuff like that. Now, i got to be real careful how I teach this because, you know, I'm all for natural health. I, I respect it and things like that. i got a brother just sent me in the mail uh, about a book that how all diseases and stuff, they, uh, something about genetic theory and how they say that, it, well, it's passed on and it's hereditary and it's really not. And this, this guy wrote a whole big, thick book in a time that I wasn't spent prepping and studying for this message. I was reading a couple pages on that thing just to kind of get the, get the feel of it and stuff like that. So there's, uh, that's, there's some things going on that churches, and our churches, they get tore up over this type of stuff. And, and there's something about this passage here that says, if I teach you to abstain from meat as a doctrinal conviction, my conscience is seared. If I, if I actually say, don't, don't eat meat, and I'm saying, that's my doctrine, don't you dare eat it, then my, it tells you, it shows you that conscience is actually seared. And uh, so here's how you know something is, is wrong with your conscience, okay? Here's how you know, is you could, uh, you know, if, if you can say something that's contrary to Scripture and, and not get convicted about it at all, 
If you walked around and said there's no hell, you should be, you should be convicted about that. If you walk around and say baptism saves you and you go to heaven by good works <laughs> and you're saved and you walk around saying that, your, your conscience should convict you. If it doesn't, it's telling you it, it, thing might be getting seared. Okay? And another way you could tell if your conscience is seared is that if you're doing something that's, that's questionable and then, and then you use this message that I'm talking about tonight and you, and you try to justify it for any of you to try to do something that's questionable. That, that's crooked. And you run out of here saying, you know, Vinny said this is intellectual conviction. I don't, the Holy Spirit ain't bugging me about it. And it's really not scriptural. So, there, so then you run out of here and try to do something questionable. <laughs> then you're crooked. And don't come at me and, 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 and blame me about it because you're doing something that's questionable. So watch out for that. So what, what should you do? I'll give you some advice. All right, number one, you've got to learn your scriptural convictions. You've got to learn them. Uh, those are, what are those? Those are, your, those are your Bible doctrines. What do you believe? Why do I believe it? Our, our, our Bible doctrines, very important. You should know your Bible. Not just, I'm a King James independent Bible-believing Baptist. You know, well, what do you believe? I believe what King James, King James Bible-believing Baptists believe. <laughs> no, you shouldn't say that. <laughs> you should know what, what you believe, why you, why you believe it. You've got to learn your spiritual convictions, okay? Okay, and then number two is you've got to obey your spiritual convictions. If the Holy Spirit deals with something, he'll, here's how I'll deal with you. Go talk to so-and-so over there. How many times that ever happened? Go, go give a track to so-and-so right there. And you got a decision to make. Am I, they're going to think I'm weird. I'm scared. <laughs> I can't do it. That's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will do that. I'm not, I'm not super ultra charismatic and think the Holy Spirit would give me you know, I saw one in Macedonia crying out to me. That's a different time. You know, I understand what Paul was going through. It's signs of an apostle and all that stuff. But you know, one time in your life, you, Holy Spirit led you, go to, go to that person. Give them a gospel track. You know, talk to this person about the gospel. Holy Spirit will do that to you. Or and he'll tell you, look, don't go here. You know, you want to eat a hamburger, go right down to five guys real quick. Get yourself a burger real quick. Don't go eat it in the purgatory. Okay, that's just, you know, little, little spiritual convictions or whatever. Then take, you got to pay attention, take heed to your natural convictions. Pay attention to those, okay? But, like I said, you got to beware because society is trying to corrupt your natural convictions that God instilled inside of us. He's trying to, society's trying to corrupt that stuff. You know, uh, I got to go farther with that. Now look at Romans chapter 14. Romans 14. Right, here's, here's, here goes, goes a little bit more with the intellectual side. Romans 14, look at verse number 1. Romans 14, 1. Romans chapter 14, verse number 1 says this. That's page 1505. Let's see, Romans 14, 1. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. Imagine that. Don't just receive a guy into your fellowship just to argue with him. <laughs> I just can't wait to get on you about such and such, such and such, which we're gonna, we'll get into in this passage here, okay? But not to doubtful disputations. And a lot of what the intellectual convictions end up being is they end up being doubtful uh, disputations. That's what, what it is. Doubtful disputations. Now look at verse number 2. For one believeth, that he may eat all things. Another, who is weak, eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth not, for God hath received him. Okay, you see that? So, you know, I know, you know, we, what we like to say is that everything's just all black and white. So you, you better, and that's right. You know, and you say, well, okay, so you got, you got to take a side. You got to pick a side. And do you know what, what side God takes here? Is He says, look, you know, I'm, I'm over here, you eat that, I'm right. And guess what? You're over there, and you don't eat that, and I'm right. <laughs> okay, so the, it's, it's, it, he's, he's actually with both there. And then he says in verse number 4, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To, who, to, to his own master he standeth or falleth. He knows what he can do, what he can't do. He when it comes to this thing about eating, he shall be holding up 
for God is able to make him stand. One man, okay, we just stop there. That's just amazing, actually, okay? You just think of that. So they're both right. Yeah, then somebody says, no, no, they're not. Then they're both wrong. Well, that's not right either. There, there can be rights and wrongs in, these, in this category. And, when, and, here, and this really helps you out here. Verse number five, a certain thing here. Look at verse number five. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another esteemeth every day alike. This is a big one on holiday celebrations. Okay? But look at this part. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Here's the big deal. Verse 6. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. And he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth eateth to the Lord, for he giveth thanks to God. He giveth God thanks. He that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. If you're not giving God thanks in either one of them, you're wrong. Uh, so you got to get that. And if you're not esteeming the day, whatever day you pick, if it's not unto the Lord, you're wrong. And if you think every day is alike, and you're not esteeming every day alike unto the Lord, then you're, you're, you're wrong. You're wrong there. Now, you know, I don't care if you keep Christmas or not, but as long as it's unto the Lord, not just an excuse to get gifts. So you gotta, you got to get that. And, and if you don't regard it, you, you, you know, then, you, then you don't regard it as unto the Lord. Uh, you know, if you set aside a, a day and you thank God that His Son was born, is that a sin? No, it's not a sin. You know, I, and I've heard Bible believers, they talk about, you know, Christ was born on October 23rd. Some say September 23rd. Some go as... He was born April 1st. Uh, some say he was born December 21st. Then they, some people say he was born December 25th. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you think about this. You know, we, we, tell, we tell people 364 days of the year, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Get your mind on Christ. And in one day out of the year, you go to public. You go to a store in public and they got a little manger scene out. And then you go into stores in public and they're playing Christmas hymns. And then we walk around and tell them, this is wrong. This is pagan. Get this out of here. <laughs> One day of the year, they want to think about Christ. And then we go and blast them because and tell them they're wrong. It wasn't born this day. <laughs> I mean, what, 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 you know, what, what's up with that? And I think it's, you know, come to Colossians 5. Let's go to Colossians 5. Pick up the pace. I told you it would be a little long one. Colossians 5. And I believe what's more important than, than whipping a brother over the head. Because, or, or go, you know, imagine that you got a Christmas tree in your house. I'm flipping that thing over as soon as I come in your house and seeing that. <laughs> you know, I know it just that's, that sounds crazy, and we we can't do that. You know, I'll t you know here's something to kind of here's something to get, get you worked up a little bit. How about this? Look at Colossians. How about Colossians? Let's see if I could find it. Uh, let's see Colossians chapter three. Look at verse number five. Uh, Colossians three. Look at verse number five. All right, it says this, mortify, that's put to death, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. What are they? Fornication. All right, fornication, you know what that is, that's sex outside of marriage. Just shacking up with people. Put that away. Fornication. Uncleanness. Doing dirty things. Inordinate affection. That's straight up out of the ordinary. This thing is this thing ain't even ordinary. It's borderline. This ain't even natural. Okay, yeah, that's weird. Inordinate affection, and it gets worse. Evil concupiscence, concupiscence. You get that Cupid, Cupid. Remember that that devil? He shoots arrows and casts love spells on people and stuff. Concupiscence. <laughs> that's a strong desire. Any selfish desire for an object, person, or experience. So there's something sexual about that, but then it's just for living for a certain experience all the time. Evil concupiscence. And then look at this. In covetousness, which is idolatry. There's a definition for us. What does it mean to be covetous? It says I, you know, covetous is as idolatry. So I'll, I'll, tackle, I'll tackle that one. Let's just suppose, you know, anybody messing around with all them other crazy things. But let's, they're, all, they're all lumped in the same thing. We, I mean, we, we got you. Got to look at that though. But it says covetous, which is idolatry. And this could go something like this, you know. Man, I just got to have that truck, man. You know, you're talking. Yeah, bro, it's a nice truck, good truck. Man, I, then you see him again. I just got to have that truck. I need that truck. Look how pretty she is. She's set up high, got the high suspension, big rims, 
thing spinning, leather interior. This thing smells. I need this thing, man. And you say, yeah, man, it's nice. Good truck. I like it, too. It looks good. Next thing you know, it comes over to you again. I need this truck, man. I want this truck. Ain't that truck? Look, there it goes driving down the road again. It's in white. Which one do I want to get? The black one? The green? You know? And then finally, you just say, Look, sh shut up. <laughs> get out of here, you co covetous idolater or something like that. Because, you know, the, things like that is like, you see what I'm saying? Is It's it's not just the grievous sexual perverted sins. It's, you know, I, you, you well, I, that's why I'm calling out covetous because you're more like me and you are more liable to fall into covetous than maybe some of those out, you know, out of ordinary type stuff there. So, like I said, I don't think it's it's worth flipping tables over. Maybe, you know, you got a tree in your house or whatever like that. But, you know, the truth is Christians, they worship their their clothing, their jewelry. They worship their R-rated movies, uh, their movies, uh, their cars, their children, their, their friendships, sex. That's the stuff Christians will tend to worship. And, uh, you, know, where, you know, where your worship is, is if, if something consumes more of your time, more of your devotion than God does, then you might start having an idol on your hand. And it turns into idolatry. So, you know, that's, it's, it's about your attitude. It might not be so much about the object itself. You know that. You heard that before. It's okay to have things as long as the things don't have you and, you know, stuff like that. But if clothes are your idol, what do you do? Stop wearing clothes? <laughs> no. You just... Go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, look, you know, I'm too preoccupied with all these clothes and stuff. You got you to help me with this, with this trouble and, and help me be more preoccupied in the, in the, you know, further in my fellowship with you and things like that. So, you know, come to Leviticus. This leads me to another thing is, you know, I can't, I can't bow down to a statue of Mary by accident. I can't do that. If I'm bowing down to a statue of Mary, I'm doing that thing on purpose. <laughs> You know, you heard me say it before. You know, you, the point is, you can't ignorantly worship something. You don't walk in through the woods. I'm taking a hike through the woods. I trip and fall, and I end up going. And I'm falling on my knees to some tree. Oh, I accidentally worship the oak tree. <laughs> you know, oh man. You know, no, it don't it don't work like that. It doesn't work. Like, so look, see, Leviticus 26 is about this idol thing, real quick. Leviticus 26, verse number one. Ye shall make. You no idols, nor graven image, neither rear you up a standing image, neither shall you set up any image of stone in your land to bow down unto it. Why? For I am the Lord your God. So the point is, if you're, if you're bowing down to your home decor, you have an idol on your hands. Okay, you do. You know, you, 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 don't, you don't ignorantly worship that stuff, okay? So, if you want to know real quick, I'll, go, I'll blow through it real quick. Is if you want to know my intellectual and, and, you know, spiritual convictions about holidays or whatever, uh, some, most of them are actually intellectual, I'll give you them. Here's my checklist, okay? Christmas, Santa Claus, reindeer, uh, flying reindeer, elves, no. <laughs> don't mess around with that, all right? Christ's birth. You know, lights that shine in the, in the midst of a dark night. How miserable it is. It gets dark at 5 o'clock. I enjoy seeing Christmas lights out. Lights, okay? It makes me think the light of the world, the light of the world is born. He's birthed, you know? Uh, traditional meal preps. We sit down. We have a, most times it's a traditional meal, whatever, you know, for the family does and stuff. Then you give gifts to people and stuff. After working a long, hard year, you labored your whole year and you want to take a time to, I'm gonna buy people some gifts. That's a blessing. Yes, I'll, I'll I'll do that. Then you got New Year's comes up, and I got your pork roast and sauerkraut and shrimp cocktail. That's tradition. I'll take it. I'll take that. But then you got the champagne and the partying. No, I'm not gonna take it. And you got Valentine's Day comes up. Okay. Then you got the mythical Cupid. Okay. That whatever that thing is, it's a devil. He's shooting the little arrows. You know. Casting love spells and things like that, Cupid's everywhere and stuff. Were you gonna deal with? I don't. I don't want to do with Cupid. Okay, no. But what about taking your wife out to, uh, to on a date, going to a restaurant, and just remind her how much you love her? You know, give, give her one, give her a day, a Valentine's Day. That's I'm. I'm good with that. I'll put that as a yes. Check that. Check yes. And you got March shows up. And you got St. Patrick's Day. Uh, you know, I don't really 
care about that. I don't really pay much attention to that, but I know you got leprechauns running around and pot of golds and, you know, Catholic canonization of saints and stuff. No, I just don't fool around with <laughs> wearing green. Okay, you can wear green. You know, that's, I guess that's fine. Yes. <laughs> but all the rest of it, no. Then you got Res Resurrection Sunday, more commonly known as Easter. Okay, magical Easter bunny that hides its magical colorful eggs around. No. I'm not I'm messing with that. But then you got getting, you know, uh, I, I don't know what I'd do. If, I got, if we had kids, am I going to get my kid an Easter, Easter basket with some, you know, I still call it Easter basket, with little chocolate, little eggs in it, little, you know, peeps and stuff and whatever. My mom still gets me an Easter basket after all these years, you know, but whatever. And, and you know, I get make this Easter basket and I tell them, here, kid, this is, we, we worked for this. This is from Magical Easter Bunny. And, and let's, re let's remember that when Christ rose from the dead, he arose and he gave gifts unto many. That'd be a good time of the year actually to distribute gifts. That's what Christ did when he resurrected from the dead, Ephesians 4. Then they got this, you know, what about this, the sin of, of dying an egg? Well, right now I don't care about dying eggs. I care about eating them, but <laughs> dying them, you can die them anytime you want, all year round. I used to die eggs as a kid. I mean, that's, you know, that's what, that's what me and my mom would do. And, you know, and then you'd come up to me and say, don't you know where them eggs, how, what that came from? The pagans, they dipped them things in blood, and it was a blood ritual for fertility. They dip them eggs in blood. It's for, you know, getting a whole big disputation over that stuff. Where did you get all that stuff at? The encyclopedia? Yeah. Did you get that from Alexander Hislop's Two Babylons? Yeah. That's another book. Most people get that. So that's not a scriptural conviction. It's an intellectual one. That's what it is. And you got Mother's Day. Taking one day out of the year. Can't you kids take one day out of the year? To hug your mother, tell you I, I love her. Thanks, mom, for you know birthing me into the world. You know, you know me and my mom. We we'll bicker every so often, but you remember, you remember, you I birthed you. Thank you, mom. You're right. Thank you, mom. I love you. Thank you. Okay, Mother's Day, one day out of the year. And then you say, well, don't you know that's a day that the pagans went around and worshipped the, the the goddess of Diana and all the pagan female deities. You know, is that is that where your heart's at on Mother's Day? The goddess Diana, <laughs> or, is your, or, is your, or is your heart on your mother? You know, Father's Day, same thing. Dad, I love you. Let's go out and go do some golfing or hunting or fishing or whatever you guys want to do. You know, whatever. Uh, Fourth of July shows up. You get your hamburgers, hot dogs, fireworks, guns. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We're for that. I'm, I'm, I'm for that. Yes. But then you got the beers, the booze, the partyings, the pot. No, no, okay. And you got October, Halloween shows up. You get the pumpkins, the corn stalks, the bales of hay, the apple picking, the pumpkin spice creamer. <laughs> yeah, man, that's me, you know, sure, I'll take you. And you got the goons and the goblins and the skeletons and the death. I don't want nothing to do with that, no. So, you know, maybe, or maybe, you know, taking time to remember all the dead martyrs that died to shed, the, that shed their blood actually to get you this King James Bible. You know, I preached on that last, around Halloween Day, remembering the martyrs. I think that actually has a good, uh, a good thing to it. You know, they say All Saints Day. They remember the dead saints. I'm not praying to them, so check that off. No, I'm not praying to these people. <laughs> then you got Thanksgiving shows up. Then you got the turkey and the potatoes and the yams and the corn and the stuffing and the pies, and you're reflecting on your thankfulness. Yes, I'm for that. And then somebody comes up and says, don't you know them pilgrims came over and killed them Indians and took the land, and you wicked you know, call me all kinds of names or whatever. No, that's not why I'm partaking in Thanksgiving because I can't, something where back in the day came over and did and, I, and that's why I'm celebrating it because we took those people's lands. No, that's not why I'm, I'm, I'm celebrating that thing. Then you got birthdays. Cake, ice cream, taking time, thanking God for creating you in the womb. God created you in the womb. You know, that's a blessing. We got life, we got breath. That's a, that's a blessing. And then take, you know, it's our birthdays. Uh, that's a birthday. And then, and, and then th take a time. Man, I th I'm thankful for the second birth. Thankful that I got born again. I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, you know. But So that's good. But then you got the birthday bashes with the booze and the pot and the clubbing and all that junk. No. So there's my checklist. All right, that's my checklist. I don't know about yours. But you as a, as a, a Bible believer are not keeping those days as unto a pagan god. To get the whole deal of it all is you have to keep it as unto the Lord. That's big. That's actually that's the most important thing of it all. 
So it's not sinful about observing days as long as it's unto the Lord. And, um, you know, of course, you know, things like drinking and smoking and all that, you know, rest of it and getting carried away with all that. But you got that. And I'll come back to Matthew 21. I'm going to close up here, okay? So you need to learn your scriptural convictions, obey your spiritual convictions, pay attention to your natural convictions. You know, when in doubt, don't do it. All right, and then you got to practice Romans chapter 14 when it comes to your intellectual convictions. All right, Matthew chapter 21. I'm going to try closing up here. Um, Matthew chapter 21. There's a long one. Let's see here. Matthew chapter 21, verse number 14. I want to try to end on some good notes here. Matthew 21, 14. So we talked about convictions. Uh, you know, things get out of balance with that. Now I want to talk about compassion. So Matthew chapter 21, look at verse number 14. Look what he says here. Right after what he did, okay? Look at verse 14 now. In the blind, in the lame, came to him in the temple, and he healed them. The guy just got, Jesus Christ, you know, say it reverently. He just, he flipped tables, he flipped chairs, he's whipping people out of the temple, and people are actually coming to him. That's why, that's why I love the Bible. It's just, it's, that, that just amazes me, you know. You go, to a guy, you go to a guy like that and just made a scene like that? But look, but, so here's the deal. Is, and then it says this. And he healed them. So they got, they got what was needed from coming to the house of God after the Lord Jesus got rid of everything else that was not needed. They got the help that they needed. Okay, so people say, you know, you hear this, if, if you, preach, you preach too hard, it'll, it'll kill a church. You know, it, it may run off some people that don't love God, that don't love the Bible, but real Bible preaching will get people to come in. It will, and it'll get people to keep coming back. That's what real Bible preaching does. And there's a, there's a lot of people out there that, you know, who need help. And, you know, they don't want to come into, you know, a, a dead church or whatever, or all, you know, legalistic and liberal or whatever. And I want to be able to feed them from the Word of God and I, I, so that they can leave here changed by the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, and, and so that the, they can have the power of God in their life. So we've got to have some convictions, but we've got to have some compassions. We've got to have compassion. And we can't let our convictions be misunderstood to, you know, to the point that it keeps those from coming into the temple that needs healing and help. People need help. So the, you think about that. The blind and the, and the lame were not fearful of that man that they just saw having a whip in his hand. They weren't fearful, fearful because they saw his righteous indignation, but they saw the compassion that he had in his eyes. And it caused them to come in to him. You know, that, that outshined that whip that he had in his hand is his compassion. So... As a church, you know, you reach people and there's, there's going to be all kinds of people at different spiritual levels in, in a church. And, you know, that's, that's, that's part of it. And uh, we got to make sure to keep the compassion strong, though. Not just that it's all convictions with no compassions. There's a, we got to balance some things out. And we got to, you know, experience as, as much, we should experience as much weeping for sinners a good prayer. Lord, give me a heart for lost souls. I, I need a, I should, we should be weeping over sinners more so than we're concerned about just whipping over certain standards of people. You know, so we've got we to get that down. So, you, you remember how much God loved you when you first got saved? You know, he, he, that, as soon as I got saved, man, I know, he loved me. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whosoever believed in him should not perish, have everlasting life. That's God's love toward us. And he, you get saved, he expects you and I to show the same love that he had toward us the moment we got saved. And we didn't have everything all fixed up and worked out. And so I learned that if you, know, if you got your convictions right, and if you stand for what's right, you're separated for what's right, uh, then your compassion should be just as strong. And that, comes, that has to come with some growth. And I know at first we're just all whipping. We're like the sons of thunder. You know, we're going out and just blasting whatever and, until finally you got to learn, well, there's a little more to it. And just all convictions and standards, there's the compassion, okay? So la lastly, I just want you, to, I want you to realize, <clears throat> I want you to notice in verse number, let's see here, verse number 20, 
3. Okay, I want you to notice his refusal to compromise. Okay, Matthew chapter 21, verse 23. And when he was coming to the temple, you just imagine that. The very next day, you imagine a preacher making a scene like he did, and then, and then next thing you know, he's coming back into the temple to preach a, ser a service next time. He's teaching, you know. Now imagine that. And look at this, though. The chief priests and the elders of the people came. You know, I'm people I've always been in church. You know, the, the, this is the religious crowd. Came unto him as he was teaching. In the middle of his sermon, he's there, he's coming, they're coming up to the Lord and said this, By what authority doest thou these things? Who gave thee this authority? Imagine wag wagging her finger, pointing at him and stuff like that. So the Bible says the religious crowd. Notice this. It wasn't the prostitutes that were questioning Jesus. It wasn't the dope addicts that were questioning Jesus. It wasn't the, the uh, none, none of them types of people. It was the religious crowd that was questioning Jesus. you got to think about that. And, uh, you know, they, 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 they hated his conviction of what he just did. But they, they didn't understand his compassion. They misunderstood that, okay? So he said, who gave you this, you know, who gives you this authority and stuff like that? And, um, you know, Jesus asked, I, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, he, he actually didn't even answer it. You could go on and read, and read the rest of it and all that stuff. Now, where does this, where, where does this authority come from? You know, uh, now I'm preaching the Bible. It comes from the Bible, number one. Okay, the authorized King James Bible. But real Bible preaching, it does, it does not, uh, it, it does not cause real, real Christians to run away and leave. It causes them to keep coming back and stay in. And, uh, and, and, and uh, at, the, at this time, you know, Jesus didn't decide to drive them out, okay, at this point in time. He, he looked at this as, it, man, this is an opportunity. I'm going to show them, I'm going to show them compassion a little bit. I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, compromise and things like that, but I just want to close on just two thoughts. I'm going to give you two thoughts. Uh, if, if, if a church, if it's all about just whipping and flipping, it'll become just a assembly of a bunch of religious nutcases. I'll say that as much charity as possible, if that's all that we're concerned about, okay? And if, you know, walks around, we think that we're better than everybody else. If somebody comes in here, you know, they got a tattoo, they come in here, they got pink hair, they got come in here, got big holes in their ears or whatever. Uh, you know, if, if, if we're more concerned about that right, out, right away, and then not then their, their spiritual help, we got big problems, you know. If we're more worried about a sinner, imagine that sinner shows up driving in the parking lot, we see him, he's smoking a cigarette, pulls up to our church. We're going to go out there and say, you throw that cigarette down. You shouldn't be smoking on the church grounds. You know better. No, he don't. <laughs> the guy don't know better. They're already nervous as is coming into a, a church, you know. We're, we're going to throw the cigarette out of their mouth right away? We can't. You got you to get them to the Lord and stuff like that. You got to show some compassion and stuff and Get visitors or whatever. You shake their hand, talk to them, be friendly. Say, hey, man, notice, you know, one came along. Praise the Lord, Jeanette. There, there's one of them. She come, come by herself. Good to meet you, Jeanette. Pleasure to meet you. Thanks for coming, you know. It'd be nice. Hey, I, I noticed you came alone. You mind if I sit down next to you? I just want to make you feel welcome, make, make you have some company for today, you know. Just good good stuff, good basic stuff. We can't, let, we can't allow our separation to become our God, uh, you know, and how much that we don't do. That makes makes us better than everybody else because these are things we don't do and stuff. And somebody that, that that comes to our church, they and they need help. They need to be healed. They come in, they're, they're blind. They don't know anything about <laughs> anything, you know, about the truth of God's words. We got to show some compassion, show some grace towards them. And look, I I want to I do want to live a balanced life. That's and that's hard. I that's very hard. And and I want to I I want to stand for what I know is right. Okay, and I want to stand for what stand against what God condemns. I want to love people where they're at, you know, and and uh, and and then, and then from there on, show them and teach them a better way of living, a better life. Okay, so and tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ, how He changed my life, how He changed your life, and, and so you can live a, live for God. And like I said, I'm evidence of that. You're evidence of that, and uh, you got to hear me on that stuff. And that's why we must find a balance in those, in those three areas. Let's bow our heads. Let's talk, talk to the Lord for a little while. <clears throat> All right, dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, I'd like to thank you, Lord, so much for your word. I'd like to thank you, Lord, for 
that that picture, Lord, that, all that learning that you can give us just from that example of what you've done, Lord, showing your compassion, your convictions, your uh, refusal to compromise. Uh, Lord, I pray that you we, um, we we get our convictions in line. I pray that we exercise uh, s some grace, like that says uh, in that one song, uh, more grace to others show. Uh, I pray that you help us, Lord, uh, obey our uh, scriptural convictions, uh, believe what we believe because what the Word of God says, and pay attention to our uh, spiritual convictions um, and our natural convictions, uh, and just um, help us, Lord, with our intellectual convictions and not to enforce them upon other people or uh, develop a spirit of pride or uh, think that we're better than anybody, Lord, because we're not. We're just all a bunch of saved sinners uh, by the grace of God. And uh, help us, Lord, live a good good life. We want to we want to live a good life that's pleasing to you. We want to do what's right. Help us take a stand like you did, even if even if we might have to do it alone. Help us, and just uh, maybe just be filled with the power of your Holy Spirit. We can't do nothing. We can't do anything, Lord. Nothing at all without you. And we always remember that. And uh, just may you help us, Lord, with with this topic that we undertook here tonight. We give you all the praise and glory for it, and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you all for hanging with me. Um, Julie, you want to cut that? We'll pick a...